From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is on an adventure, but will be returning shortly. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. We are quite excited about today's episode. You know, it's um, it's reminding me, Matt, it's often said that there is a great crime at the heart of every great fortune. And it's also often said that two sorts of laws exist, two sets of laws, one for the very, very wealthy, one for everyone else, all the other schmucks. But in today's episode, we're diving deep into a story that doesn't often get told until now. You know, if you're a longtime listener of the show, you know about things like Project Paperclip, the secret program Uncle Sam used to bring Nazi regime scientists to the U.S. But That's only part of a much, much larger story. What about the other secrets? What about particularly all those business leaders in Germany, the individuals, the families, the dynasties who made fortunes off the atrocities of the Third Reich? And what about their heirs? What about the folks who inherited these fortunes? This is the question our guest, journalist and author David Dejong, explores in his newest book, Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. It's a pleasure. We're very excited to be speaking with you. Uh, We've read through much of your book. Ben, I believe you've read the entire thing. Uh, Yes. (laughs) And we've, uh, we've watched interviews. We've talked about Nazis since we were making videos back in 2010. It's just, you know, when you make videos about the unknown and mysteries and strange things, uh, the Third Reich has plenty of material to go into. Yeah, definitely. But we, we have never explored the fortunes that were built off of things that occurred during the Third Reich's reign. So we can't thank you enough for doing the research, for writing this book. Uh, I, I think, uh, what, Ben, let's just, let's talk about, like, David, how did you get into this? How did you begin this investigation and journey? I started looking into these families at when, while I was still at Bloomberg News, I was working as a reporter in New York. I was actually hired in late 2011 uh, on his new team, which investigated hidden wealth and billionaire fortunes. And the team, it started right around when Occupy Wall Street ended. So there was this really, you know, it was basically the start of this of this narrative of the 1% versus the 99%. I mean, since then, it's really become the 0.1% versus the 99.9%. And I was hired as one of the, uh, of the reporters to cover the Americas. Um, but I was soon asked after a couple of months to, to cover the German-speaking countries because... I am Dutch. I'm a yeah native Dutchman, and I you know I, I I tell a little bit in about in the book about how I had this sort of reluctance to cover German fortunes or German or German business in general. You know I'm probably I'm, I was born in the late eighties, probably the last of the generation which grew up with this kind of I call it in the book playful antagonism uh, that I had vis a vis. Germany, the Germans, you know, because of the brutal occupation that, that, that happened, you know, in the Netherlands between May 1940 and May 1945, which also affected my family. Uh, my, my grandfather was, uh, you know, he tried to sail to uh, England with his best friend, he was a very avid sailor, um, and to join the Royal Air Force uh, in 1941. And the second time his boat was blown back to shore, they were arrested by German soldiers. And they were sentenced as political prisoners to two-year forced labor in uh, in the rural area in, in in Germany, just over the border. And you know, my grandfather was six feet uh, six foot seven. He came out weighing ninety pounds, and luckily, you know, he survived. He he convalesced in, in in the sanatorium in Switzerland and got married to my grandmother, and, and my mother soon was born after. And then, as for my my father's parents were Jewish and as were my great grandparents. And my grandfather hid in Amsterdam for three and a half years after his textile factories at the Dutch German border were, were were seized. 
And uh, my grandmother was, uh, you know, she was Swiss. She was Swiss, and she fled with my my aunt, who was three at the time, and a companion to to the French Swiss border. And they were arrested by the Gestapo, off by by, by the, Gestapo, the Gestapo, the the Nazi Germany secret police. And miraculously, a Gestapo officer took pity on them and and let them and or took pity on my aunt and my grandmother and let them off. And then they fled over the mountains into Switzerland and into safety. Uh, but her companion was deported to to Sobibor and was murdered. So it was, you know, it's a miracle that I am here today. And I was very much, especially by my maternal grandfather, he lived, I described it in a book, I mean, he lived in a very small village in the south of the Netherlands, where all the Germans would always go every summer to to to, to go to on beach holidays um, nearby. And, you know, then he would always quip, um, you know, another invasion incoming. And he, he kind of raised me always, he was kind of my hero, my, my maternal grandfather, and he kind of raised me with this idea, you know, don't, you, don't take the Germans too seriously because they take themselves too seriously. <laughs> but I came, I actually came to take them very seriously, particularly, you know, when I was asked to cover big business and finance uh, in Germany, because, you know, what I, what I quickly found is that particularly large brands like BMW and Porsche, they maintain these global foundations in the name of their founders or their or their saviors or their patriarchs, and they celebrate th- th- these men's business successes, but they do not mention anywhere that they're conducting philanthropy, global philanthropy, in the name of men who committed war crimes or men who were members of the SS. And that is actually the reason why I wrote the book, not because of my personal uh, relation to to the story or, or by, because of my personal background. No, it's because I was just stunned by after a so-called r- reckoning, you know, as they as they see it, occurred that they're still doing the, that they're, they're still maintaining these, you know, doing these, you know, not only the, it's not only the foundations. It's global headquarters, corporate headquarters. It's it's journalism prizes in the name of these men without being transparent about about the bad things they've done, only celebrating the business success. And I think that is, that is you know, leaving out that history is, is, is unacceptable to me. Yeah, it's deeply unethical, to say the least. And that's something that really stuck with us when we were diving into the stories here. Because, you know, I do have to admit, there's a bit of dark humor with Bloomberg saying, okay, yeah, go go cover this. And you having to say, do you have any idea what, what you're asking me to do? Uh, and I could sense right. that I could sense that reticence. Uh, but it did it did pay off in a way that many, especially many Americans, are not aware of. You know, uh, many people in the US know of some business stories from that time in Nazi Germany, you know, like Coca-Cola inventing Fanta or IBM's disturbingly cozy relationship yes. with the Third yeah. Reich. Absolutely. And, yeah, and the list goes on, but people here often think of those relationships as singular, isolated moments in business history, isolated from the current day. And I want to know if that is an attitude or a perspective that you have encountered in Europe, in the U.S., or maybe even in Germany itself, is there an active, coordinated effort in some cases to sanitize history, for lack of a better term? I mean, there's this kind of tried and true method, at least in Germany, where, you know, a media scandal, you know, it's like clockwork. Every year, some media scandal breaks about a famous German business dynasty with, you know, global business interests, for the most part. And, you know, some investigative reporter in Germany uh, digs up their their hidden uh, third activities of, of patriarch X, you know, who, who was a committed Nazi uh, party member, who used mass force and slave labor, who mass produced weapons, who, you know, acquired companies stolen from Jews or acquired shares far below, you know, market value because people were desperate to leave, to flee, Jewish people were desperate to flee Nazi Germany or expropriated companies of people who were, and, and the livelihood of people who were living in occupied territories. So what then happens, are two, the response is that, okay, we're going to commission an academic study. It's going to be an in, independent academic study. You know, we're, we're, uh, we've, we've, we've asked a, a prominent uh, a German history professor to, to, to do this. Him and his team as researchers 
we'll conduct this and 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 you know three four years later uh, you know, we will open our archives as well for the first time and, and three, four years later, then it's silent, you know, and then three, four years later, a study, a study is published. Air X gives one uh, mea culpa uh, interview. Uh, um, and, and, but what happens then with the reckoning? I mean, you have a very dense academic study in German that does not reach a wider audience. It remains, the story itself remains contained to Germany. And, you know, Barely any translations, you know, bar few exceptions, you have very few translations of these studies ever, uh, ever produced. And the question that I also have in like a large picture is who exactly is this reckoning, this purported reckoning with, right? Because, you know, for the most part, the Germans were not the, the, the victims of, of Germany's own crimes. It were millions and millions of others living in Europe, you know, were forced into forced or or slave labor um particularly in eastern europe you know uh, poland ukraine uh, russia uh, belarus partaking in, in in some part as well uh, in, in in the holocaust too you know or or having led uh, concentration camps and and, and etc or having built them who then is he reckoning with because it never reaches the surviving uh, former forced or slave laborers or their heirs right they don't read academic german so then companies like BMW and Porsche can, can go on and, and pretending like nothing's happened. And there's also the sense that they lean on Germany's collective guilt, right? We were all, I mean, you know, you also have to imagine that Germany still, you know, every time one of these business families or one of these massive global companies comes out with a study, I mean, they get inundated with this stuff. You know, you get so, in Germany, you, learning about the Third Reich era is, is it's, you know, and being confronted with it is omnipresent, Right. So it is, you know, at one point, unfortunately, you become, I mean, I imagine they become desensitized to it. So in a way, they, they are able to contain these narratives to Germany. And yeah, I'm, I'm bringing it to a global audience now for the first time. We're glad you're doing that. Uh, you just hit on something that I just want to talk a little bit further sure. about. You kind of out, you outlined it pretty quickly there. Well, this is two part. So first, are there any car manufacturers that don't have a background <laughs> relationship with the third Reich. Uh, yeah, I was just looking good, through the list in question. your book and <laughs> yeah, my yeah. goodness. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I, that's kind of a joke question. I'm sorry, but, but yeah. it, it, you just named so many major car manufacturers that are still yeah. big players today that did have a background. Let's dive a little deeper into what exactly companies like BMW were doing during the reign of the thir third Reich to to gain profits and um, to make those fortunes that we're talking about. The main family I'm writing about, the Quants, who came to control BMW after World War II. So the, the, the patriarch, Gunther Quant, and his son, Herbert, they, they, they controlled, um, Gunther mainly controlled and, and operated uh, a massive battery manufacturer and a massive arms manufacturer. And quickly after Hitler seizes power, he starts in secret this massive rearmament uh, push. And, you know, all the industrialists who, by the way, and this is also one of the myths I'm trying to dispel in the book, you know, most of the families I'm writing about were already extremely wealthy when Hitler seized power in 1933. Except for the Porsche Pierre family, who today controls the Volkswagen Group, which has Audi, Porsche, Volkswagen, Seat, Skoda, Bentley, Lamborghini, so one of the largest car manufacturers in the world, their wealth really started because of their relation with the Third Reich and because Hitler put the Volkswagen in, in production, which for non Porsche, car design company, also ended up taking off uh, in this era. And, you know, all of them were already extremely wealthy, bar them. And after the big uh, rearmament push starts, Billions and billions flow into the, the coffers of, of the industrialists that are producing, that are now producing, mass producing weapons. And then you have all these decrees that come out that are issued, which, you know, incrementally takes the assets of Jewish people living in or sees the companies of Jewish people living in Germany. Of course, once the war breaks out, you have that extended, you know, to Nazi occupied territories as well as, you know, well, because German men were, were being called to the front, this mass rounding up of, of people all across, of men and women all across, and teenagers too, all across Europe, who were then being 
shipped off uh, or deported to forcibly work in factories in, in all across uh, Germany, as well as slave labor from concentration camp from concentration camps later on during the war. So these are really the, the main components of how these families benefited uh, from the Third Reich. And benefit they did, because as you as you establish in the recent New York Times article, uh, which which is also a fantastic overview of some of the problems here, uh, as you establish, you you open with some critical facts about the scope and power of Germans modern automotive industry. Right. It, it is it is huge to call it a Leviathan is maybe a bit unfair even, but it's not hyperbole. The, no, it's not. No, yeah. I think it's a pretty fair description. Yeah. The, well, the thing that gets me about this is and I think it gets Matt, you as well, is that for people in the U.S., there's quite a disturbing comparison to be made between the, the deification of these titans of industry and their families yeah. And we've got to talk more about those families in a second. But there's there's this clear comparison to be had between the way that parts of the U.S. have deified um, Confederate memorials, right, or yeah. uh, officers in the Confederate Army. Right. And I'm wondering, do in your opinion, what how would the people of Germany react if there was a movement to you know take these? Nazi sympathizers' names off of foundations or to, you know, uh, be more transparent about their past? Would they, would the German establishment push against this? What would the reckoning be? Interest, that's a very interesting question. I think there would be the German establishment, which is, is in part, are these families I'm writing about, of course, and their, and their handlers and, 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 and the entire coterie around, around them, of course, don't to to a large extent do not do that, right? They leave their dark histories out on the websites of the of the Global Foundation they control through, you know, their global brands such as BMW and Porsche. But I think the vast majority of Germans would be delighted if they know if they knew, if they're aware, would be delighted to to, you know, either see these companies being pushed to be transparent about it online. Or or see these see, see these foundations or media prizes or corporate headquarters re, um, renamed. I mean, what I write in the in the New York Times essay is what I wrote in the New York Times essay as well. Was how you know I lived I moved for this book I moved from 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 New York to Berlin in, in late 2017 and you know there is such a awareness and such a nuance and such an such a introspective discussion going on in germany um about this past and it seems like the most powerful players in germany do not want to do not want to participate in that and that is of course very damaging because these families are not only economically powerful the quad the bmw quants are also the largest donors to to the Christian conservative uh, CDU Merkel Angela Merkel's uh, uh, party, right? Um, and and you know their, their spokespeople all were, worked for CDU politicians, so it's very much this is the total establishment I'm writing about, and and they they clearly do not want to uh, want to engage in this on a global level at least. I want to play devil's advocate just for a moment, David. Sure. Uh, for this, I, I spent quite a bit of time on some of these foundations websites where you're right. They don't talk about any of these things and the yeah. connections, but they do uh, all of them without exception. They have these very lofty goals. They've, you know, they state things about their missions that like, I, I love like this. These are great things to try yeah. and do and, and to work towards and to pour money into. Um, I, I just, it feels as though there's good work. Specifically, I'm looking right now at the BMW Herbert yeah. Kant Foundation, yeah. uh, and I, I just like what um, what is the goal? What is the goal? I guess in in having a foundation like that, like really come to terms with their past. It's not the foundation, of course. It's 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 a company itself, and and it's controlling shareholders, and it's quite perverse in the case of the BMW Quants who. It would commission this academic study in 2007 after a critical TV documentary, you know, came out on Gunther and Herbert Quant's Third Reich past and act activities. 
And, you know, four years later, the study is, is published. Stefan Quant, who's one of, with, together with his sisters, the controlling shareholder of, of BMW, gives his interview to Die Zeit, um, the one of Germany's leading newspapers, and says, you know, we're not going to rename our headquarters, named after Günther Quant, we're not going to re rename our, um, our media prize, named after, after Herbert Quant, we're not going to rename our foundation, but we will remember them in, you know, the, with the good and the bad things. But it becomes completely, but he never says how they're going to do that, right? So in 2016, so what leads to this very perverse situation where in 2016, they, they, they make the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant global and make it much larger. And Stefan, uh, Stefan Quant and Susanna Clatton, the siblings, you know, both give, um, uh, you know, uh, tens of millions of dollars to this foundation. And then the motto is, inspire responsible leadership. I mean, you can't make this up in the name of a man who, yes, he saved BMW from bankruptcy in 1959, but who also, um, this man, you know, who also uh, built uh, or planned, built and, and, and dismantled a sub-concentration camp in Nazi-occupied Poland in 1944, early 1945, who had the responsibility over, over battery factories in Berlin um, where, you know, Thousands of forced slave laborers were used, including 500 female uh, slave laborers from concentration camps who helped acquire companies in France seized from Jews and were used as private estate uh, prisoners of war and, and forced labor. And to inspire responsible leadership is to be transparent about that history and not to leave that out. You know, the BMW Foundation, I asked them and they said, well, we are only uh, concerned with what, her, what, what Herbert Quant did during his ownership of BMW between 1959 and his death in 1982. Whereas when the, spokes, the, the spokesperson uh, for uh, Stefan Quand and Susanna Klatte, uh, when they suddenly replaced part of the biography on the Herbert Quand Media Prize said, oh, this year we decided to, to replace after 10, uh, this year we, did a, we reviewed our web presence and we decided to go for a more holistic biography of Herbert Quant, which now shows that these, you know, and, and they did that a couple months after I asked an ignored question about whether they considered the website of the Herbert Quant Media Prize, a journalism prize, where four also of Germany's most high profile journalists serve on, if they consider that to be open and transparent, never got a response on their question. Three months later, overnight, suddenly a new biography footnoted still leaves out a lot of Herbert Kwan's uh, Nazi era activities, but at least now it says that, that he had the responsibility over these Berlin battery factories. And then you have the spokesman saying, after I confronted him with it, he said, oh, we decided to go for a more holistic uh, uh, view of Herbert Kwan's life, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's truly beyond irony, uh, unfortunately. And with that, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back. And we've returned with David Dijon. I want to set up uh, a moment in the very beginning of the book, uh, wherein you write beautifully about this really disturbing, weird meeting in uh, February, I believe it is, of yeah, 1933. February yeah, Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, this, uh, you folks, you'll have to check out the book yourself to get the actual language here. Uh, but there, to paraphrase it or to summarize, around two dozen of the absolute most powerful members of Germany's business community meet at Hermann Goring's house, and they mm -hmm. are under the impression that this new chancellor on the block, this Adolf Hitler guy is going to just, uh, you know, explain his policies yeah. to the group. Right. And uh, then there's a bunch of power plays that happen at the very beginning. It quickly becomes apparent that this is not the meeting these guys thought they were going to. And it, it, it ties into a, a two part question I, I have. And it, I think we all have it. First, what actually happened at the meeting? How did it shape the events of the future. And then secondly, knowing how that meeting went, is it a good faith argument for these business leaders to have said they were forced 
to participate or to collaborate with the regime? Because, I, you know, you have noted also later in the work that uh, that was that was something a few people said, right? Like, it wasn't my choice to do this. I was yeah. forced to. Yeah, these are both really good questions. So as to your first question, at the point that the meeting happens on February 20th, 1933, the Nazi party is dead broke. There are 12 million Reichsmark in debt. And I mean, it's like tens of millions in, in, in dollars today. And uh, they, you know, they summon these businessmen under the guise of, of having Hitler explain his economic policy. And they're basically being asked to pony up to a election slush fund um, to, to, to finance the election campaign uh, that in the run up to March 5th, uh, 1933. But by the time that the election happens and a week after the meeting, the Reichstag burns down under the most mysterious of circumstances, still hasn't cleared up exactly. A show trial happens where a couple of member, communist uh, party members are put to trial and are executed, but it's not clear still to this day who actually set the Reichstag on fire. So, you know, martial law is implemented and basically all the communists and, and all communists and social democrats in Germany are, are, are arrested. Um, um, and, and also during that speech on February 20, uh, February 20, 1933, Goering and Hitler say the election of March 5th, 1933 is going to be the last election that's going to occur in Germany for the past, for the next 10 years to a hundred years time. So there ends up being about 3 million Reichsmark ends up being paid by various companies and, 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 uh, and um, industrialists and financiers. But the election itself doesn't really matter anymore because Hitler has already seized power and, and, and martial law has been declared. So did that money really matter? Probably not that much. No, because the Reichstag fire happened and, 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 and law and the rule of law is suspended, basically. But at least... As Goebbels, as Joseph Goebbels, the, the Nazi propaganda uh, or the Nazi campaign manager and, and propaganda um, leader writes in his diary the next day after the meeting saying, you know, the millions are here, you know, we can put the presses back to work. So at least for one to two weeks, they had, this, they, they, they had money, they had cash on hand and they could run an election campaign while the rule of law was suspended, what was being suspended and, and, and everything else happens. So that, that's, that's one. Now, as to your second question, did they have a choice in the matter? Do you mean generally or at that meeting? Uh, I mean, I mean generally because I believe when we're talking about facing possible consequences sure. after the conclusion of World War II, there were a lot of people saying, you know, over the course of this, I was forced to do these things. Yeah. Um, yeah, they had a choice. I mean, I, there's the example of Fritz Thyssen of, you know, uh, Thyssen Krupp, uh, now Thyssen Krupp, back then it was the Thyssen steel conglomerate and the Krupp steel conglomerate. And, um, you know, Fritz Thyssen was one of Hitler's earliest backers and, um, uh, of the industrialists because the industrialists had, and, and the businessmen and the business community at first was like, they didn't want anything to do with Hitler. It's so only when he started being electorally successful that there were, and, and the crash of October 1929 happens on Wall Street and the economy is in a big great depression starts, that they're coming around to this idea of, you know, let's check out this Hitler guy and, and Hitler himself and his, and his entourage had, just had no connection, barely any connections to, to business people at that point in time. I'm talking late 1930, early 1931. So Fritz Thyssen, one of Hitler's earliest backers, already starts backing him in the mid-1920s. He ends up, he was a member of parliament at the eve of, the, the, uh, of, of Germany's invasion of Poland in September 1939, ends up voting against the, the invasion and, and fleeing Germany and going to Paris, where he has a, an American journalist uh, write him this whitewashed book called, uh, write, yeah, write, whitewashed memoir called I Paid Hitler. And he's then arrested and uh, Fritz Thyssen is, and um, ends up in a concentration camp. So he, you know, he, he, you're talking about one of Germany's most powerful industrialists who just two turns against the regime and has, as a result, has his, um, 
has his steel conglomerate, of course, expropriated or put under trusteeship of, of, of somebody else, actually the right-hand man of one of the main characters in my book. And, um, you know, you, so you had it, you know, if you, you, you could turn again, they had a choice. Absolutely, they had a choice. Gunter Quant, arguably the main character of my book, uh, or one of the main characters of my book, you know, he writes in his whitewashed memoir that he, that he, that he writes after the war in 1945, 1947, uh, when he's in detention, when he's in American detention, actually, in Germany. He writes how he could have left to North America or South America, where his business partners were during that era, but that he stayed put, you know, as he puts it himself, to be a loyal soldier to, you know, to, to, to protect his, his, his factories and his employees for, for, you know, to keep them running, basically. So he, he admits that, you know, he frames himself as a, as a, you know, as a Nazi, uh, as an anti-Nazi and somebody who was a victim of the regime, even though he was not one of Nazi Germany's largest arms manufacturers and one of the largest user of, of forced and slave labor and one of the largest, you know, beneficiaries of, of stolen companies, uh, both in Germany and in occupied territories. I want to I want to stay in that realm 1945 1947. Sure. Um many children are taught about the Nuremberg trials and they are aware of those things and the consequences of people who are directly involved uh in the war especially you know on the military front. I personally and I think many of a, many people out there don't know what happened to these corporations and these private interests post World War II that are in Germany. Um what happened to a company like BMW after a war like that? There were all these plans, you know, the initial plan is if Henry Morgenthau was a treasury secretary under Roosevelt, you know, uh, proposed this famous plan initially in, I think, I believe it was 1944, which became known as the Morgenthau plan. And which is this, which basically calls for this, the, the complete destruction and dismantling of all of German industry and, and the summarily execution of, you know, not only of military and political leaders, but also of, of, of German industrialists. That plan ends up being scrapped. And instead, there's a focus on, as they called it, the five Ds, which is, which is in, the, in the Potsdam Agreement uh, of, of August 1945, which Stalin, um, uh, Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin, Harry Truman, and Clement Attlee, the successor to Roosevelt, uh, agree on. You know, the five Ds are denazification, which is a word you hear a lot nowadays because it's what Vladimir Putin uses to describe what he's doing in Ukraine. It's just obscene. Um, the, the word of the, the, the use of, I mean, what he's doing is horrific, but the use of that word denazification in that context, because denazification was, became a very flawed legal process that saw millions of Germans uh, basically go free uh, for uh, crimes they committed under the Nazi uh, in, during the Third Reich or sympath the Nazi sympathies that they had. So there's denazification, there's decartelization, which means, means the, 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 the cartels, the, the big uh, industrial conglomerates were, were broken up. Deconcentration, which was referred to German industry being less concentrated, yeah, being less in the hands of being less, you know, too big to fail, less in the hands of the very few. And demilitarization, which speaks for itself. But in the end, you know, the deconcentration and decartelization, they happened with a company like IG Farben, which was the largest uh, chemical company in the world at the time. And, you know, you have today, you have Bayer and BASF, which is the, today, Bayer is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and BASF is the largest chemical company in the world, who both c came out of what IG Farben uh, was. And, like, you know, there's EG Pharma, but for the rest, but the rest, all the German company was basically, or all the German business basically remained intact. There was a massive continuation of the power structures, both economic and politically, but mainly economically, that remained in place. Because, of course, very soon after World War II happens, the Cold War emerges and... It's in America's best, best or deems it in its best interest to have a strong industrialized democratic West Germany to you as use as a bulwark against the encroaching Soviet Union. And for that, it needed a economically viable West Germany. So 
German business needed to be protected and German businessmen, um, you know, except for the three industrialist trials at Nuremberg, were basically let off scot-free. I'm seeing so many parallels. It's kind of what Ben was already uh, talking about here. Parallels between what occurred then and then what we're seeing happen right now. And you, you just hit on it just with a simple word that's being thrown around right now as a as a justification for actions being taken that appear to be uh, appear to be World War Three like, let's say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they, they do appear. They do appear so certainly. Well, and it makes me think about the economic sanctions that are placed, like the, the weapon of war of choice from, you know, NATO and, and much of the West is, is economic. And we're hitting in these places, we're hitting the industry, right. As much as possible. Um, I'm just wondering how you, after doing all this research, looking at the profit centers of the third Reich, looking at these, these families that, you know, you can kind of see it mirrored in the oligarchs. Like what, what, what other, mirrored situations do you see happening right now from what you've learned in researching this? What you see happening now, of course, is the main parallel is what's happening uh, with the Russian oligarchs and their devil's pact with, with Vladimir Putin, which was, of course, the Russian oligarchs, for the most part, took their, you know, grabbed the, their initial assets in, this, in the Wild West of the Russia of the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin, and then consolidated their power with, you know, with this devil's pact in Putin uh, in the early 2000s and have been allowed to, you know, operate unfettered globally since and are now having this moment of reckoning because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And of course, because of their, because they owe their rich or they owe their maintenance of their billion fortune and assets to their relationship with Putin. That's the clearest example I can, I can, you know, it's the clearest, I mean, it is very, very, you know, in a sense, it's very timely, but that's the, you know, it's the, it's the clearest example I can think of at the moment. Let's pause for a moment. We'll have a word from our sponsor, who is hopefully not Krispy Kreme, and we'll be back with more from David DeJong. And we're back with more from author David DeJong. One other thing that's interesting, when we're looking at the human element of this, um, you had already, I want to talk a little bit about process. Uh, this is sort of a meta question. Sure. So, um, you have, as we established earlier, uh, spent years investigating hidden wealth, uh, the storage of money or the transit of money for billionaires and uh, high net worth individuals. Yeah. Uh, when, when you were in the midst of the research for Nazi billionaires, were you able to apply some of your um, earlier research processes to these cases? I'm just, I think we're both interested in learning how difficult it was or was not to get to the bottom of stories about complicity. You know, there are parts of the book where you, you talk in particular about the extreme privacy that a lot of these yeah. heirs have. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, it feels like you're, you're searching for answers that don't want to be found. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you navigate that, especially given that these are very powerful people? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a reporter, you know, I'm a reporter first. So I did reporting. And of course, because I have one heir talk to me or correspond with me on the record. But other than that, I, you know, had spokespeople answer uh, part of my questions. And but for many, I also just received no comments. I received a few statements here and there. But that was about it. So I had to report around the subject and I had to use with, you know, uh, I had to do multi-archive research in, in, in Europe and the United States. You know, of course, one of the main uh, sources of information are all these massive academic studies that have been commissioned, but that, that you know, have never been really delved into or, or, or used as sources in a journalistic work that brings this to a larger audience. Um, I mean, there were many, many memoirs poured over 
you know, hundreds, if not thousands of historical documents, a lot of them, thankfully, that have been digitalized, diaries, the, the diary of, of Joseph Goebbels was more for the narrative itself rather than for the larger question was, was, a, was, a, was a great source. I mean, and then it's just old fashioned reporting, you know, you, you try to talk to people, but not even the people, you know, the, the heirs in question didn't want to talk to me, but also nobody around it, you know, uh, lawyers or the family offices or, you know, any, it was, it, it's also exactly these people are extremely private. So, you know, it's, um, you know, a lot of talk, spoke with a lot of historians too in Germany, which was, which was also important to kind of, you know, for the framing of the entire debate. I have to ask, you know, that really stands out because we've spoken in the past on this show about how privacy becomes a powerful currency all its own, especially in a world where everything is connected, right? And one passage I, I really wanted to drill into is when we're talking about families, I was fascinated by how you were able to map out the families and the businesses that they control or controlled. And in particular, I was interested in the story of the Ryman family. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where, where you say, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, I had no idea they're a huge deal. And you also kind of, at one point, you, you mention that there is no public photograph of yeah. the Ryman heir. Yeah, that's which, correct. Okay, so that uh, all right. I wanted to make sure I wasn't misreading. No, no, that. no, no. You are yeah. you are very right. So yes. how did you find these families? <laughs> like, how did you actually? It's fun. It's 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 very interesting. You bring up the Rymans, um because it actually the first story I ever did on a German business family was for Bloomberg was in April 2012, uh, exactly ten years ago when they initiated when the Ryman's or their entity, JAB, which controls an incredible amount of American uh, uh, fast food and consumer brands. I mean, I can go, I mean, there's just so many Krispy Kreme donuts, you know. Uh, Name Einstein. a few more. I want to yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> I mean, Krispy Kreme donuts, Snapple, 7-Up, Panera Bread, uh, Einstein Bros Bagels, uh, Curry Green Mountain, uh, Pete's Coffee, uh, I mean, that's not even half of, of uh, Koti, which is the, the makeup. Uh, I mean, this is incredible. And they built all of that up, those are the brands, except for Koti, in the past 10 years. Um, because they started their executive to have a man who made them as rich as they are today, their chairman, Peter Harf, who uh, initiated this coffee, uh, sorry, this, yeah, this coffee strategy it was in 2012. But it started with them trying to buy with Koti, which they already owned for, for a long time buying Avon, the hair products, the famous uh, uh, American, uh, well, it was a door-to-door -door seller, I think. And that's actually the first time I ever reported on a secret of German dynasty, business dynasty. And, you know, the Rymans, I use them at the end of the book as a counterexample to the other families in, in the book, because in the 2019, they emerged as, as Germany's wealthiest family. Um, you know, I spent years reporting on them for Bloomberg, a reporting on their global deal making, and reporting on all these other families' Nazi history, having no idea that the Ryman's itself had the most bizarre Nazi history of all of them. So it, it, it's it's crazy how this story. For to me, it's crazy how this story can totally full circle with the Ryman's, because in March 2019, just as the as they emerge as, as Germany's wealthy, wealthiest family. They, they have Germany's largest tabloid built on Sonntag or largest Sunday ta tabloid um, built on Sunday. They break this huge story. This reporter, Maximilian Kiewel, uh, breaks this massive story about the dark history of, 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 of Germany's wealthiest family, uh, the Ryman's. And he goes into how the patriarchs are, you know, both deeply committed Nazis uh, as members of the SS, um, 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 donors to the SS, Sit on the municipality in their in their in their city where they're from in the south of Germany. For they they they, they serve for the Nazi Party. You know their company was quite small in comparison to the other families I write about in the book, but they use hundreds of of of, of forced laborers in their chemical companies, in their chemical company called Bankiser, and they have a particularly brutal factory foreman who abuses who you know abuses uh, forced laborers in the most horrific uh, ways. 
and you know, Kewal discovered all of that. Now, the Ryman's, and I was quite in touch often with the spokeswoman, um, you know, the Ryman's had already commissioned a, a, a history professor to, to dig into that history before the story broke. They, he was commissioned years earlier. So you have their chairman, Peter Harf, issued his response. And then two months later, this massive story in the New York Times breaks of the Ryman's, of two Ryman heirs for the first time ever speaking on the record with Katrine Benholt, who's the New York Times bureau chief in Berlin, about how their father, Albert Ryman, the committed Nazi, had an affair with a Jewish woman whose father was deported, deported and, 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 and or, sorry, half Jewish woman, or a woman of Jewish, with Jewish roots, because her father was Jewish and was murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and how they have this, this narrative, this very tragic narrative, which are only later found, much later found out about being the heirs of both a, you know, being descendants of both a perpetrator and a victim. And they end up renaming their foundation uh, in the name of their murdered uh, grandfather, Alfred Landecker, and funding it in perpetuity with 250 million euros, which is, you know, 300, uh, 300, 350 million dollars every 10 years. And, but still being transparent about that their patriarchs, you know, were total Nazis and, and, and anti-Semites, and even their great aunt was married to an SS man. I mean, it's really like they were just truly a Nazi family. And then, you know, Albert Ryman, their, their, their father, who was married to a woman but didn't have children with her, fathers three children with this half Jewish woman. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, these heirs end up, um, and some of their cousins end up as Germany's wealthiest family. So it's, it's totally, it was totally bizarre, totally bizarre story. You know, I mean, it's, it's very tragic and, and just bizarre, surreal and tragic. I mean, I can't, yeah, can't make it and anything else of it. Wow. Thank you, Ben. I did not, I did not know that last story, I guess, from the end of the book there. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, David, we have a, a unique thing here where we've just completed our first book and it's uh, coming out in October. Congratulations. Check it out. And we, we know the process now of yeah. uh, cutting, cutting, what is it? Killing your darlings. The expression yeah. of like yeah. having yeah. to get rid of certain parts of the book because they just don't happen to fit in the story you're telling. I wonder if there's anything in your research that you came across that would, you know, just be a story that you'd want to tell that you had to take out of the book. Oh, wow. That's such a good question. I had to cut about a hundred pages of the, I ended up cutting about a hundred pages of the book. I think everything, sorry, this is kind of a lame answer, but I think everything that I wanted in the book ended up in it because, you know, the hundred pages that were cut had a, great editor in the US, Alexander Littlefield, and, and in the UK, Arabella Pike. And they, you know, they gave fantastic structural feedback, which allowed me to, to rewrite the story in a way which made it far more slimmer and better paced. And those 100 pages that were cut were really, were just redundant, was redundant information. So, you know, everything that I wanted in there ended up being in there. I, so I didn't really feel that I had to cut any major darlings, which I feel very blessed about. Congratulations. It's <laughs> amazing. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. And, and with this, you know, we have, to, we have to ask, there's a sense of mission, right, to telling stories that some powerful people would rather not be told. And I think we're both very interested, and the audience as well today, uh, I think we're all interested in hearing what what you hope comes about as a result of this of this investigation. Uh, what you know, I saw an earlier interview. Not that we were stalking you too much, but saw an earlier interview where uh, where someone asked you what the reaction in Germany was like yeah. when the book came out, and you had said at least at that time. You had said the the press was a bit silent. Was that yeah, the case? It has been. That, I mean, really I mean, the book. I mean, we're talking on April twentieth. The book came out on April nineteenth, so yesterday, and that interview was also from yesterday. And you know, so far, I mean, the German translation is going to come out May fifth, 
And we'll see. I mean, it is an extremely fraught subject in Germany still. The press laws in Germany are also not as free as they are in the US, unfortunately. Um, you know, so it is very, it is very difficult to, no, I mean, you can report on it, but it's all, it's, it's all, it's a very, it's a very fraught narrative in, in, in Germany, uh, still, of, of, of course. And so far the, the German press has been silent. We'll see what happens when the German translation comes out. Germany, as is the US too, there are massive countries, massive economies, and they're very, they're insular countries, you know, they look inward. You know, because they're so big, they don't really need to look at at other, you know. And and Germany itself, you know, it's not natural per se to 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 take over what the English language press is is is, is writing. You know, you saw that with many things that happened, like when the Bild editor in chief was fired uh, only after Ben Smith of the of then of the New York Times still wrote a column about his uh, about his. Um, you know, his sexual harassment cases are gone. I mean, these were facts were known in Germany for, for, for months and months already, you know, they were out, but only after New York times, because of course, because Axel Springer, the conglomerate that owns Bill just bought Politico for a billion. They were realized, okay, our, 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 our business interests are at risk here. You know, it's a story with Wirecard. I don't know if you followed that story that the FT journalist, Dan McCrum reported on incredibly well. Um, you know, they didn't, they accused the FT of, of the German stock market regulator. Um, uh, they accused the FT of, of basically manipulating and, and, and Dan Crum was, was sued in Germany for his reporting, you know, until, until uh, Wirecard went bankrupt and filed for insolvency. And now the CEO is in prison trial and their CFO is, is missing. It was, it was, you know, purported to be a Russian spy. I mean, this is also a story you guys should look in because it's so, it's such a good story. Dan McCrum is coming out with his book later this year. And, um, and I'm sure it's going to make a huge plus because the guys' the stories about Wirecard are wild. So, so often nothing happens in Germany until uh, stories are reported in the English language press. But it also takes a little bit, you know, for things to land in Germany. You know, it's Germany's in many ways, it's old fashioned. It's an old-fashioned country in many, many ways. Yeah, it's going. It's heading the right direction, but but you know, it still has big, big ways to go. All right. So May fifth, we're gonna set our uh, set our alarms here to know <laughs> to just yeah. watch the yeah, papers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, keep an eye on Der Spiegel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we, exactly. We've yeah, got uh, first. Thank you for being so generous with your time, David. Uh, as as you can tell, and as our as our listeners can tell as well, uh, we agree that humanity, civilization, owes it to itself to be transparent about yeah. these stories, even even if they seem uh, to make people uncomfortable. I would say especially if they seem to make people uncomfortable because they're discomforted for a reason. In with with this. Uh, what we can say is we wanted to hold off on this interview until the book was out now. So, so now that the book is out in the world, you can find Nazi billionaires, the dark history of Germany's wealthiest dynasties anywhere good books are sold. Uh, German listeners, as, as David and Matt pointed out, the German edition is coming out May 5th. Keep an eye on the news uh, on the other side of the pond. And with this... I, you know, I I know we were talking a little bit off air, but you're already on to some new projects. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm moving to um, to the Middle East. I'm moving to Tel Aviv, to be more specific. My partner has a job. She's the, um, the new correspondent for German TV for Israel and the Palestinian territories. And um, she has already moved there in August. So, I mean, can you imagine a tougher job in journalism than being... The German core TV correspondent for German television in Israel and Palestinian territories. I mean, I have so much respect for her. She's 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 an incredible reporter, an incredible hard worker, and somebody who studied both Arabic and Hebrew in university. And just you know, I'm I'm amazed that 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 I get to be with her, such an incredible <laughs> woman. Um, well, we wish uh, her safety. Just yeah, I mean, you no, know, yeah. Just reading news from from that region and on this other on this other side of the world. It, there's a tremendous sense of, you know, yeah, no, it, is, it is, it is. Yes, no, absolutely. And I'll be covering, um, the middle East, the, the larger middle East, 
um, um, from 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 Tel Aviv. Um, you're still covering financial and finance and business uh, as usual. Okay. Well, uh, can't wait to learn about you know the oil money. Uh, right. It's going to be yeah. exciting. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of focus on the Gulf, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, David, is there a specific place that people should go to, to get your book? If you want to order it online, do it at bookshop.org because they support uh, local booksellers and independent bookstores. They need all the help they can get. Um, and, you know, you can find me uh, on Twitter and Instagram at David De Jong. And with that, folks, we are going to call it a day. Get the to your local bookstore and find out more about this very important story that very powerful people would rather you not hear. Uh, We can't thank you enough, David, for being so generous, as we said, with your time today. And we cannot thank you enough for the Herculean amount of research that you have put into this. I I knew it was serious when I was, I was uh, Matt and I were lucky enough to read advanced copies and I, open the book and one of the first things I see uh, are this collection of maps. And I think, okay, this is going to be one of those things where you don't read it straight through. I'm going to have to go back to some stuff. And so I broke out, uh, broke out some sticky notes and kept track. Yeah. And um, we're just, we're grateful. This is in the world and we can't wait to see uh, where this adventure takes you, but please stay safe. And, uh, and we'll talk with you soon. Thank you very much for having me, Ben and Matt. It was really a pleasure. And as always, if you would like to connect with us uh, regarding ideas for a future episode, regarding your own experience with hidden history, we'd love to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the hits, all the good ones. And if you don't like the uh, online stuff, you don't sip the social meds, we have another way to contact us. That's right. Our phone number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. When you call it, you're going to be leaving a voicemail message please give yourself a cool name and let us know if we can use your voice and message on the air you've got three minutes and if you've got more to say than can fit in that three minute voicemail message why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email we are conspiracy at iheartradio.com Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.